And I told him that, you know, he had to go. I said, I unfortunately cannot continue to live with you. Seeing him possessed oh, in, wow. a, in engaging in a sexual act, I mean, he turned back and he looked at me straight in my eyes and the face of the enemy came through his face and he grinned wow. at me wide, almost like that cat in the in um, Alice in Wonderland. The grin went really wide. Um, I asked the Holy Spirit what he meant and he said that was the demon that's possessing him. He has to go. I didn't realize that I would have to go through deliverance from being intimate with him. Didn't even realize that I had a soul tied to this person. I would, I would hear things in the nighttime. I would have spiritual attacks in my sleep. And it wasn't, com it was like, almost like the word R-A-P-E. It wasn't enjoyable or pleasurable. It was like it was being taken from me. I'm in the, in my bedroom, the, the Holy Spirit moved my hands to my wounds. Like the Holy Spirit was telling me that's where the demons are and laying down on the floor, feeling the Holy Spirit almost lift me from my shirt. Even growing up, I grew up Baptist. We don't say Yeshua. And I'm like, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. And I'm feeling the Holy Spirit lift me from the ground. I'm feeling it grab me by the collar and lift me up off the ground and let me go. Lift me up and let me go. Lift me up and let me go. Hi, welcome to today's episode of Touching the Afterlife. I'm Julie. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for subscribing to this new channel. And I want to consistently bring you inspiring stories from my amazing guests with their powerful testimonies so that you will feel blessed. And today I have with me Janae. Janae has been through a lot in her life. Hardships, disappointments, death, toxic relationships, and much more. But she's overcome much and she exudes beauty and grace. So welcome, Janae. How are you? I'm doing really good. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm so glad you're here with us today. I'm excited to hear your story. Will you start with just where you want to start maybe with your childhood and your mom? Um, the beginning for me started way before um, me coming back to Christ and reigniting my love for him and just being on fire again for Christ. It really started in my childhood. Um in my household where my parents raised me, specifically my mom, with a belief for God and a belief in Jesus Christ. And um, as a young girl, I always believed in God. I always knew that Jesus was real. And um, of course, somehow that sh I strayed from that, but I always had a belief, in, a belief in Christ. And I remember on my testimony, one of the things that I mentioned was just how I knew that Jesus was real and how God was real in my life was um, just a random situation. I'm waking up out of bed and I'm a little girl. I think I was probably like five or five or six around that time. And if anybody knows me, they know I have really poor eyesight. <laughs> and part of that um, was I started wearing glasses at a very young age. And I remember specifically waking up one morning, usually my glasses would be on my nightstand next to my bed and they weren't there. And I had an experience with God where um, he gave me my vision back temporarily. And I was able to reach out to God, like speak to God and ask mm -hmm. him where my glasses were. And I was able to reach underneath my bed. And, you know, he was telling me the voice of God was telling me to reach under my bed and grab the glasses. And that's where I found them. And it was so odd because typically that wouldn't have been the response that I would have. I'd lost my glasses many times before. But I remember mm -hmm. hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit just guiding me in that moment and just feeling mm -hmm. something to me and realizing that it was something external to me that was guiding me to do that at such a young age. And I knew that I could depend on God for that, even if it was something as simple as losing my glasses and needing them, because my mom had already instilled in me, anything you need, ask God. And so mm -hmm. I applied that like immediately um, and I applied that to every other thing. If I wanted to do anything, I would be like, okay, God, I want to do this. Can you make it happen? Same for ballet. My mom had me in ballet as a little girl and I wanted to do ballet. We didn't have the funds to do it. I prayed about it and someone blessed my mother mm -hmm. with the ability to um, pay for the classes and I got ballet. So I was just being Love a kid that. Mm -hmm. thinking that God was more like a genie. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I was like, it, it works. God is real. I, I felt it. I know yeah. he's real. Yeah. And he loves he loves us coming to him even like a child, like now when we're adults, right? <laughs> yeah, a childlike yeah. faith um, that doesn't ever doubt that he can do anything. Yeah, I agree. So so he showed you where your glasses were in that moment, and it was completely dark, right? Yeah. So I woke up early in the morning. The glasses weren't on the nightstand and I was freaking out. I had like this emotion of panic. I remember that feeling of panic at such a young age. And I, for some reason, didn't think to ask my mom or run and go find my dad. I was more concerned, like, why can't I find the glasses? So I'm, you know, panicking. And I asked, like, God help me find my glasses. And Mm -hmm. I remember specifically, like for a short sliver of a second, having good vision. And I had poor vision. I literally was failing in in like kindergarten because for some reason they didn't know why I wasn't able to read. And I'm like, I read at home. And, but what was happening was I was taking my glasses off at school and trying to be like all the other kids. And so when I do my work, I wasn't applying myself the right way because I couldn't see they found out, hey, she's blind. She can't see. But literally in that second, I feel like um, the Holy Spirit allowed me to be able to see enough to function. And then I heard a voice told me to look under the bed. And I reached under the bed and I could feel the carpet in my fingertips as I'm talking about this. And then the rim of the glasses was on my fingertips. And I grabbed them, pulled them on, put them on my face, and I went about my day like it was normal. But even now as an adult, thinking back to hearing that thing, uh, just th- the Holy Spirit speak to me, look under the bed. It wasn't a thought. It wasn't an internal voice. It was external. And it's weird because now I understand that God was audibly speaking to me at that time. And wow. I didn't have the comprehension or the discernment to know that that was a supernatural experience. And so right. I- I just love that story. You know, it's simple, but it's, it's profound because he's in the little details of our lives, right? Amen. So why don't you share with us now, kind of later as you grew up, some of the hard things that started taking place for you? Yeah. So really, I have a magnitude of difficulties that I could really go back and express that I went through, but The major ones, I would say at that age, you know, things seemed really normal. Um, I had a two parent household. We lived in a suburban house. Um, My parents had just purchased the home. I had two siblings. I thought everything was super normal and regular. And I thought that this is just how everybody lived. And I thought things were good because my parents, they provided for me. I had all my needs met. Things were normal. Um, I didn't know they were struggling financially. I didn't know their background. I didn't yet know the struggles that they endured as they, you know, grew into the adulthood that that God was calling them into um, and just matured by age. But as I got older, more like seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, I was starting to see the discrepancies in their relationship, uh, the arguing, the cursing, my dad having... <sighs> Now I know it's narcissistic uh, traits and tendencies, but the control that he had, the uh, verbal abuse, the consistency uh, with certain things in his life, but inconsistent with his family. It was very weird because my dad was a smart man. He was very Mm -hmm. um, mathematically smart. He was very strategic, entrepreneurial, driven. Um, But a lot of that came out in the wrong ways. He didn't know how to harness his gifts and actually apply them because he didn't have a relationship with God. And as I got older, I realized that my dad's behaviors were starting to become abusive, or at least they probably previously were abusive. But I noticed um, the abuse to where I could understand it and comprehend that that was happening. And I just remember a time where he started to become physically abusive in front of me and my siblings Mm -hmm. and he would curse at my mom and she was a very timid person. She went, she grew up going to Catholic school. She was very soft spoken, but I remember a shift in her personality where the abuse from the narcissism that she was experiencing and the control and the verbal abuses that abuse that she was experiencing, it shifted her to being very abusive herself. 
And she would yell and she would respond very like frantically. And if we made too much noise, there was so much, you know, rage that would enter her because I think her nervous system and her body had responded so much to the abuse that she'd experienced from my father that Mm -hmm. she couldn't really like fathom living normally anymore. And she started to spiral into depression. My dad got diagnosed with diabetes in his 30s. And from then on, he had consistent health issues that led him to having three strokes, two heart Mm -hmm. attacks, um, brain aneurysm where he was in a coma during my middle school years, Um, literally so unhealthy and becoming such an angry person. And Mm -hmm. my mom still decided to take care of him and participate in a relationship with him, even though they were separated on and off. And eventually that led to their divorce. And um, it impacted me in the way that I saw so much chaos that I would kind of gear off and go into my own world. And I'm an artist. So the whole time while all these things are going on, I'm just perfecting my art skills, self-isolating, building my own relationship with God, because I'm seeing that these people that have led me to God don't really have a real healthy relationship with him and just kind of being a loner and just. It was almost like self-protection. That was your intuition to, to do that. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Correct. So from there, what there, you said your parents got divorced at that yeah. point or they were about to. So they got divorced. Um, my mom started to become a single mother or she mm-hmm. became a mother. Um, I would see my dad here and there, but then he ended up relocating back to Chicago where he's originally from Mm -hmm. and um, felt like abandonment, of course, because I didn't understand his reasonings. He was now a debilitated man in his 40s and 50s, and he couldn't take care of his family. Um, Mm -hmm. In the before my dad got really sick, um, and wasn't able to take care of us physically, uh, during the separation, my dad got involved in some very illegal things, um, where he ended up getting arrested and Mm. my mom and dad, that was their first separation. It it had to do a lot with the abuse, but when she found out that he was involved in illegal activities and it jeopardized us, it jeopardized our household. We were living in a really huge home, not knowing Mm. what was going on and here my dad, he's getting dressed in a suit, going to work every day, but literally living a double life. And his double life was um, selling drugs. And so um, we were benefiting and living a normal life while this person was actually, unfortunately, doing something that he shouldn't have been doing. And that led my mom to completely divorce him, separate from him, couldn't deal with the abuse anymore on top of legal issues. Mm -hmm. And she to separate and go her own way. As a single mother, I could tell that was a lot of pressure on her to provide. Um, She had been a stay-at-home mom for many years. And in addition to that, the times that she did work, the money that she would receive would go to whatever she wanted to spend it on. So she had to really shift her lifestyle from being codependent on my father financially um, and to take care of us to literally going out there into the wilderness and figuring out how to provide. And that's when my mom restarted her relationship with God, which affected my relationship with God. And I started getting more involved in church. I was doing like the teenage, you know, the teenage groups, the teen groups that they would have with the small groups in church. And unfortunately, um, my mom's relationship with God, even though she started going back to church, she developed an um, alcoholic you know, addiction and started to drink alcohol for depression, anxiety, um, Mm -hmm. panic attacks, and Mm -hmm. PTSD from the relationship. Wow. So do you think that part of that was she never maybe dealt with a lot of those issues prior? Yeah, absolutely. I do feel that she, I do feel like she had a strength that was, pretty much a front 
for the pain that she was going through. She was very resilient and especially women of color, you always hear this thing, this strong black woman concept. And I think it's very toxic for a lot of women um, because they take strength to an extreme. Mm. And I think that's just women in general, but it's very prevalent in our community that um, there's an extremism that's associated with strength to the point where women will literally neglect themselves and their children um, to pretend to be strong in well, front of other yeah. people. And, and the body does keep score. I mean, you can suppress it, right? But it's going to come out until we get inner healing, until we deal with those issues. Yes. So, Janae, after, so your mom started drinking, and then mm -hmm. what happened from there? Did, did she end up, tell us about the next step with your mom. Yeah, so I do believe my mom previously, even before I noticed noticed the drinking issue, um, I do believe that she had um, she had an introduction to alcohol where it was normal. It was a casual thing for everyone, family events, um, just things that we would do, right? Any type of events or any type of entertainment at the house, I think it was started. It started to start. Um, what's the best word? It started to be a normal thing. It was very normal for alcohol to be around mm -hmm. during the events. Um, but during that time where the divorce happened and separation, um, she started going out, being very active in the nighttime, just hanging out with friends, meeting other people at like lounges, very innocent based places where it's just people like going to a bar, right? Mm -hmm. But it would leave us at home by ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So my brother, my sister, um, we're pretty much like not full, fully grown yet. We're not really able to function on our own completely. Um, there was a lack of supervision. Um, and she would pretty much go out to be her, I guess that was the way she let off her, her, her stress. And so I just noticed there was a blockage in my relationship with her. Um, I adored her. I honored her. I wanted to make sure that she was healthy because I saw how much she endured and overcame. But uh, there was a huge responsibility that was placed on me as the, I would say, seemingly mature child, um, mm -hmm. because I'm not the oldest. But for some reason, it seemed like there was an influx of responsibility that got handed to me because I was very willing. And I picked up this disease to please because I wasn't getting the attention and the love that I deserved um, as a child. And I would function uh, as if I was the, the adult within my siblings. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you guys aren't supposed to be doing that. We have to do this. Let's clean. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then of course, when your mom gets home from hanging out or work or whatever she does, there's this mm -hmm. huge smile on her face because she's coming home to a clean home. Um, good kids who did their homework already and they even made dinner. So that was the way I received love from my mom was just by pleasing her mm -hmm. and seeing her happy and now that I know that that's, that was, de it was a level, of, <laughs> it was demonic because it built in me this perspective that love comes from doing things. It's mm, good. Yeah. It taught me that I would only receive love if I did something for other people, that it was an exchange. And mm. so that definitely kept me more in isolation um, and I had a codependency with my mom. I, I feel like she had more of a codependency with me because she depended on me to help her with all the things that she was struggling with as a single mother. Meanwhile, my father's over here deteriorating in health. And then my mom is starting to date again. We would have people that come live with us, like a guy that she's dating might come live with us. Her and my older brother would butt heads because he feels like he's an adult male. He, we've been on our own this long. And um, for him, it was a struggle. And I remember him kind of like leaving the nest and just kind of like isolating himself as well, just out of slight resentment um, towards my father and just not being able to steward a family when it wasn't his responsibility. Um, I think a lot of single mothers, they have a tendency to put the responsibility of a husband on their male child mm. um, because they cannot sustain the responsibility on their own 
they give it to the eldest or the most mature. And so that's exactly what happened. She gave the financial responsibilities, a lot of them to my brother, since he was old enough to work. Mm. And she gave the motherly responsibilities to me, like cooking, cleaning, maintaining the household while she worked really long hours to keep a home over our head. Yeah. And so as that was happening, and then she's starting to date and she's getting toxic boyfriends who exemplify the same relational issues she had previously, narcissistic mm -hmm. tendencies, um, some of them verbally also abusive, um, controlling, didn't want to really work or contribute to the household because they're like, you're a woman with all this baggage. Why should I help you? You need me. You're the mm -hmm. one who needs a man. And so seeing that, I saw a very unhealthy version of self-love from her as well, where I just didn't feel like she loved herself, even though that's what she projected outward. Um, so after her last relationship, who I call my stepfather, um, that's when she got diagnosed with breast cancer, which was a combination of her previously having fibroids, getting a hysterectomy because of the fibroids, having painful cycle, menstrual cycles that all were connected to her eating habits and her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So you said that she got, was diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, she was diagnosed with cancer. Um, maybe I think this was about 2000 and maybe 2016, 2015, 2016, early 16. Mm -hmm. um, she noticed that she had a lump in her breast. And of course, if anybody knows anything about the diagnosis of breast cancer, um, how the breast cancer works is obviously it doesn't just come from nowhere. It's something that's usually built up over long years of neglect or um, unnoticed changes in the body um, with her drinking habits, the whole list, I mean, the health issues, um, the stress the menstrual pain, the binge eating because of all the stress that she was going through. I think that was an accumulation of just bodily stress that caused her to go um, into her illness. Mm -hmm. And from how I understand disease now that I've learned like the more holistic pathway of living, I do understand that my mom had a genetic predisposition for breast cancer because it ran in our family, so mm -hmm. to speak. <laughs> quotation marks. Yeah. Um, now I know it's also a generational curse and how the enemy used illness to keep this generational cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but she saw the change in her breast and it, sh it first started off very small, but the skin of the breast typically starts to look like an orange peel where the pores are very large and um, they're inflamed. And you can see that the skin has like a little bit of separation around each pore. And mm -hmm. so as soon as she noticed that, um, she went to go get, uh, you know, a biopsy and get checked because it was already something that was very prevalent in generations of my family. Like my grandmother has pancre had pancreatic cancer. Her sister, one mm -hmm. of them died of lung cancer. My other aunt, which is my great aunt on her side, mm -hmm. breast cancer, throat cancer. Generations before that, there were cancer diagnoses. My grandfather cancer. So we were very familiar with cancer. She knew it was cancer. And I really do believe this. Back then, <laughs> when I was in new age, I believe that she manifested cancer. But now I know that she had a deep-rooted fear that the enemy had legal right to come in and infiltrate her faith. And she would look in the mirror. I remember being a young girl, maybe mm -hmm. seven years old, her standing mm -hmm. in front of the mirror, just obsessively checking her breast. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with her, fine. And just this fear mm. and this um, this anxiousness around possibly attaining an illness that could kill her mm. and just living like that for her whole life. Mm. And so now I realize that the enemy knew that she had that fear and there was an area where he could infiltrate her through her mm. health um, from, a, from a spiritual aspect. Yes, I agree. I'm so sorry. So from that point, tell us, she passed from breast cancer, right? She did. After she got diagnosed, um, I went on a holistic journey. I was like, okay, breast cancer. 
I know many people in my family have dealt with cancer, but what did they do about it? What, what is cancer? Why does cancer happen to the body? And so I got on this obsessive search to find solutions and to figure out how is it possible that this, this family constantly deals with this illness and what other treatments are available outside of the ones that have a 80% plus chance of actually killing you through treatment. And mm -hmm. so I started to dive into holistic health. And during my mom's cancer journey, I literally became a chemist. I became like this kitchen chemist, I call myself. It's like I went in the kitchen. I would go find all these holistic herbs. I started working out mm -hmm. at the gym daily, literally seven days a week. Um, wow. I remember first cutting out red meat and then cutting out fish. And then one day just going cold turkey vegan after watching a video about um you know, the meat industry and cows and cowspiracy was the movie. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, okay, it's, it's meat. It's, it's animal products. Maybe that's the reason why. And we eat that. It's very prevalent in our community to have with every meal. So maybe that's the problem. And so I would start making up recipes, finding out how to do gluten-free, finding out how to do vegan, how, finding out how to do raw. And I remember going on to a raw vegan fast and like making these smoothie concoctions for my mom. Mm -hmm. And I got like the green one that was from, um, I forgot her name. It just isn't coming to me right now. But I talked, I would learn about um, Joel Furman's like uh, fasting and telling her all this stuff and being so excited. And everyone thought I was super crazy, like literally thought I was crazy. I remember feeling so uncomfortable in my household because they were like, that's not how you cure cancer. You cure cancer. She has to take the chemo. Stop trying to tell mom that there's other ways. See, And I'm driving her to chemo. And after chemo, she's getting like Chick-fil-A. And I'm like, somebody help us, please. Lord, help us. And so in this time, to bring it back to Christ, I was still going to church with or without my family. I still developed that relationship with God. Um, I still read my Bible. I still sought Christ in the best way that I could. But on the other hand, there was this accessible knowledge that I was starting to learn. And I'm like, well, God wouldn't want if my mom, my mom to be sick. God couldn't have made my mom sick. Why would God allow this? And um, as I'm just obsessively on this journey, I met a guy. That's the story, start to every story. <laughs> Where there's a yeah. Slippery slope. Yes, here we go. <laughs> very, very aware and conscious of the same things that I was studying. And um, not, I wasn't as influxed as him. And he's, 11 years older than me. So he had way more wisdom or I say knowledge, worldly knowledge than I did. And during that time, my mom was like, um, I kind of feel like she was pressuring me into the relationship because she knew her time was coming. Um, so I started dating him and just forgetting about it. I was like, well, no one's listening to me. No one hears me. No one hears me that there's people that have healed their cancer that have literally had have gone from blood work where they are like so bad on one end of the spectrum. And then within two months or, or, or 60 days, they're cancer free from this yeah. lifestyle. So I'm like, no one's listening to me. My mom would take little sips and she would like yeah. participate, but she literally lives such a toxic lifestyle and her family promoted it. Oh, well, if she is going to die, then let her have what she wants to have. And yeah. it was so There's hard opinion you had a passion and she just wasn't on board but yeah. this new this new relationship he shared that common interest with you right absolutely he did so tell us about that and then how that ended up becoming toxic yeah so it started off like a breath of fresh air I actually felt like it was God sent I even remember praying about the situation and saying God this person is from you. Give me a sign. And of course, at that time, I'm super naive. I was just turning 20 years old. And I'm thinking that anything that I get is sent from God at this point. Um, my mom and my stepdad, they went through separation. Once she did, once she got cancer, it was, he was, well, my work is done here. Mm -hmm. He kind of exited the picture. Um, and unfortunately, right before he was about to exit, he ended up having a stroke, which left him paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom was going through chemo 
my sister ended up getting into a car accident, my younger sister, and she was about to lose her leg. And the doctor said, if you do not get this particular treatment and this particular surgery, you're going to lose your leg. So I have three disabled people, including my father who doesn't live in my home, um, that I'm technically caring for at this time. Um, my mom's got cancer, stage four breast cancer, chemo four times a week. My stepdad, who was just leaving out the door, he had a stroke and he's debilitated from the waist down. Can't even use a fork to eat. And my sister's in this car accident where she's no longer mobile and had to drop out of college. And so I've, That's I'm a lot. in this relationship, this new relationship, feeling like this is the only good thing in my life. And then here at home, I am caregiving and outside family started to come in and help my mother. Um, eventually, he, the, my stepfather, he got healthy enough to get back on his feet and he moved out because they had, you know, irreconcilable differences and things like that. My sister, she had a boyfriend at the time. He started taking on more responsibility as her partner. And he started helping out and just being there to help her out of the bed. You know, I would cook for them, pre-make meals, and then I would leave. I would leave. Um, I would leave on the weekends and go hang out with my boyfriend hmm. just so I could escape. Mm -hmm. And I felt so guilty for it, but that was the only way that I was mentally able to stay sane. Mm -hmm. That was a time where I could go out and hang out with him. We could work out because we had those common interests. Mm -hmm. We'd cook vegan food. We'd watch movies and listen to knowledge-based information and podcasts, even before podcasts were really a big thing. And we just hung out all the time on the weekends. And so initially was it, it was great at first. There was a common interest and you had an escape. Mm -hmm. But once the kind that kind of uh, settled down, then his, did his true nature kind of come through? What tell us Absolutely. about that? Yeah, yeah. So I watched uh, the channel that you recommended. Mm. <laughs> um, yes, Ecology. Yes, so Ecology. I videos of that mm -hmm. yesterday, which was really refreshing. Such a great, such a great conversation that's being had. Um, but it brought some things up that I didn't remember. And I'm so glad that I watched it last night because it triggered some things that I didn't feel for a long time, especially someone who's recovering from narcissistic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and just realizing that there's a level of PTSD that still stays with you for the rest of your life. But the grace of God help, helps you to function through that. Um, mm -hmm. The reason why I mentioned that is because yesterday, prior to this conversation, some of those memories came back. Um, as narcissism was being described. And I'm like, oh my God, I went through that. That happened to me. Oh, that mm. happened to me. Uh. The shift came when I think he knew that my mom wouldn't be around much longer. And I mm. believe she, he told me that she had a conversation with him and she pretty much was like, you know, please take care of my daughter. Like, I know that you guys are newly kind of together. And he's like, yeah, of course, I'm going to take care of your daughter. He had a travel-based job. Um, he lived very. Um, he lived a very desirable life. In, in from the lens that I was at, I could see that he traveled all the time. Like I was always talking to him. He's like, "Oh, I'm going to Mexico. Oh, I'm going to Colorado. Oh, I'm going to Utah. Oh, I'm going out the country. Oh, I'm going here. I'm going there." And he was just always traveling, just doing a lot of the things that I desired to do. And I remember just having these deep conversations with him about just his experiences and the things that I wanted to do and the thoughts that I had that most people weren't really able to communicate with me very well on those subjects. And when I would come to his home, there was a shift after I remember my mom getting so sick and it kind of being the end of her time. Um, I remember feeling confused a lot, like coming over to visit and then maybe getting yelled at for something, um, cleaning up his apartment and then something might not be in the right place and Jen just feeling really guilty that I did something wrong. Mm. Uh, certain things 
like we'd go in public and he would treat the person at the store really badly. But I'd never seen him treat me like that. So mm -hmm. I kind of get confused and I say, why would you treat her like that? And why would you treat that guy like that? Why were you treating him like that? And he'd say stuff like, um, mind your business. You know, and it was a very quick switch because I was used to him saying, well, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Do you need anything? What can I offer? Uh, right. Oh, we, I, I want you to switch that happened. You saw his true self come through. Yes, correct. It was actually the accurate version of him. It mm -hmm. went from the version that he presented to, to me to reel me in and love bought me right. with um, gifts, which were very small, minuscule gifts. They weren't even really that big. Now that I think about it, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how I was so charmed by these things at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but from my heart perspective, I was like, it's the thought that counts. So gift mm -hmm. giving, um, words of affirmation when I wasn't receiving them. Obviously, I came from a household where everybody's thinking I'm crazy at this point, calling me odd and you, you, you're, you need to just Stop over obsessing. If mom's going to die, she's going to die. And I'm like, okay, well, no one's affirming me in this. So here this person is affirming me, speaking yeah. kind about me on the phone to other people. Mm -hmm. And even in a situation where this person is giving in kind to me and opening his space to me and appreciative mm -hmm. of all the things that I'm doing and sees me for the real me. And yeah. then like, then he started to show his, it's the mask off experience where yeah. the mask comes off and then you're the blame for pretty much everything that goes wrong. And, and it's gut-wrenching, it's heartbreaking, but at the same time, God wanted to show you, come to me and receive that from me. So this, yeah. this relationship, how did it end? I'm assuming it ended. Um, well, I ended up knowing that something was wrong. And I remember doing a little bit of research about his behaviors on Google. <laughs> and I was like, is this normal when your boyfriend does this? Should you be afraid mm -hmm. to be in the same room with a person? Like weird stuff that I'm like, I shouldn't have to Google this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Even in my friendship groups, I was usually the person that was very supportive of other people. And, um, at the time, I remember my sister telling me she felt something was off about him. And I'm like, girl, you're a child. You don't know anything. <laughs> but she had the discernment, that childlike discernment that something is off, just like my son can see somebody and he's like, oh, mm, discernment. Yeah. Yeah. Discernment. So I ended up getting pregnant with my son. And I do feel like it was intentional because at that time, things were protected. And um, I remember him around that time telling me, oh, we should have a kid. We should have a baby. We should have a baby. Oh, we should have a baby. And I'm like, why would we have a baby right now? I'm about to bury my mom. You're mm -hmm. literally always out of town working. We don't live together. I shouldn't mm -hmm. even be with you because I'm thinking I should save myself for marriage. And somehow I'm having sex with you. Excuse mm -hmm. that. But it's so crazy how you can have one particular way of thinking and then you're just introduced to this new realm of thinking by another person. And that's how the enemy just deceives you because he sees your purity. He sees that you're trying to sustain these things. He sees that you're wanting God. He sees that you're searching for something. And so what he does is he puts you on a hamster wheel of searching for more instead of being satisfied with what the Lord has given you, even right. if that is accepting that hey, you're going to have to go and find your way now that you don't have your mom. You're going to have to figure it out and start from scratch. Who cares? This is what you do when things like this happen and God has your back. So I ended up getting pregnant with my son and I felt so unhappy about it. I knew it was not the will of God. Um, I knew that I was outside of the will of God for my life. And I knew that I shouldn't be 20, 21 years old with a baby on the way. And I just buried my mom three months before. Mm -hmm. It was odd. I literally picked up everything right before my mom died. And I left to go live with him because he moved out of state rapidly, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. didn't even prepare me for it. It was like a week's difference. And he's like, oh, yeah, I have to move with my job. And I'm like, what? And so I just... 
And then I'm looking to my mom for advice because she's the adult, but she's also like reverting back to her childlike self because she's nearing death. Mm. So if you've ever seen someone before they pass away, there's a few months before their death where they become very infantile and gentle and Mm -hmm. considerate of everything around them. And they're very reminiscent. And it's so funny because you can't really understand why they're acting like that, except for the fact that God is literally calming them down for them to go into that peace. I agree. And I noticed that with my father when I watched him pass away. And I noticed the same thing with my mother and other people that I've seen pass. And it was- I actually, I, I told you, I also lost both my mother and father to cancer. And I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm so sorry. I'm so yeah. sorry. God is good though. Um, so yes, it, you know exactly what I mean then, because I literally felt like I became a parent for her in that time. And I remember looking to her for advice, like, mom, just wanting her to say, you can do it by yourself. I know you don't want to be a single mom, but you can take that baby. You can get yourself an apartment. You're so smart. You work hard. You make enough money. You can do it yourself. Like, just don't go. And instead mm-hmm. she said, I don't know what to tell you. I'm lost too. And mm-hmm. I just remember feeling like this gut-wrenching pain and just crying from the depths of my soul and f- just watching her break into tears. Mm-hmm. And I crying together and I'm looking at her like, how dare you? Has my mom tell me to do the opposite of what I know you want to tell me to do? And I just couldn't ask for any more from her. But Mm -hmm. after that, I just accept, I felt like I accepted my fate for failure. And I said, well, at least I can make it beautiful. I'm going to go here. I'm going to make a family we're going to do this. I'm going to take all these new things that I've learned about manifesting the life I want, all these things that he's having me listen to on these podcasts mm-hmm. and work. He's living a great life. Yeah, he's a little mean to me, but he's a provider. He works mm-hmm. hard. He's ambitious. He's, mm-hmm. you know, got all these qualities of a man that I would want, even though I feel uncomfortable with him at times. Does that outweigh the great things? Mm-hmm. It was bargaining that, that the narcissistic abuse to go through where you bargain mm-hmm. while you know something is completely wrong, but you and find I think that's a good lesson for all of us is if you don't have that peace, that full peace inside, that's from the Holy ghost telling you. And if you're not connected to the Holy ghost, you're going to not, it's not going to be a strong feeling that you're going to go by. So it's important that we we go with that piece because you didn't and then things got worse. Yes. They got progressively worse very quickly because like I said I bear my well my mom was cremated. Um my mom passed. I moved out of state with him for his job. I get there. I remember literally packing up my car with just the basics of my belongings and getting there and I knew I didn't have a lot of stuff in my car. <laughs> I literally left so many things behind, Mm. but I remember getting there, walking up the steps of the apartment stairs and just being so excited because I'm like, oh my God, at least we have this, you know? And he's like, why'd you bring all that stuff? And I'm like, hey, how are you? Like, it's been a while since I've seen you and I'm carrying your baby and like, I'm pregnant. Like, Mm. he's like, well, you just sit down And I'm going to go outside and get the rest of the stuff out of your car. And I just remember him making trips up the stairs and complaining and slamming the stuff down. And I remember going quietly into the bathroom later that evening and crying Mm -hmm. and just keeping it a very like quiet cry inside myself, letting the tears flow and then just getting over it and saying, okay, tomorrow's going to be better. And then it was a bunch of tomorrows that were the same. Mm -hmm. So and just so, like your mom, you were suppressing, suppressing, but you had a breaking point. Tell us about that. Yeah. My breaking point was like four or five states later, trips out of the country later, uh, love bombed again and again, wanting to leave, wanting to fix it, trying to find a therapist. Uh, let's go to church. Well, this person has their own belief system and you've also given that up. You literally turned from Christ. You you 
you blasphemed God by adopting this lifestyle with this person. Mm -hmm. And now you better stick with this lifestyle because God's not going to take you back. You went too far. Mm -hmm. You're over here trying to manifest the life of your dreams. And even though it looks like the picturesque version of it, because you're traveling and you have this beautiful little family, you get home and you're being yelled at. You don't talk to this person. You're yelling back at them now because you want them to see you and hear you because they act like you're invisible when you talk. Um, it's a very interesting battle of the mind where someone is abusing you and yet you have to build up this strength in you to fight back, but yet you're afraid to fight. And so the only solution for me was to center myself. And this is where meditation, yoga, I already was living a holistic lifestyle, which was technically at that point becoming an eating disorder. Because mm -hmm. during my pregnancy and after my pregnancy, after I had my son, um, I started eating a raw food diet. And while I was pregnant, um, yes, I had a very successful pregnancy. I gave birth to my son like literally it was only 20 minutes I was in the hospital from when I got to the front door wow. and I didn't get to my room. They couldn't admit me. Wow. For your yeah. first child. Oh, that's, that's and how it happened was <laughs> I was walking around that morning when I woke up and I said, something isn't right. I feel like this weird movement in my stomach, not like the baby was moving, but almost as if it was like a, I, the only way I can describe it is like a train. It was like, chuck. <laughs> and I'm like, something sounds like it's working down there. And I don't think it should be working. Like somebody turned on this factory setting. It huh. was so odd. It felt like a, like a, a factory mill going on in my abdomen. Mm. And I'm like, what is this? And um, I researched it, of course, as always. <laughs> and it's like you could be having Braxton Hicks contractions. Because um, mm. I never felt the what contractions felt like. So I said, maybe it is fake contractions. I have two more months for my son to, to get here. Well, I was actually really in labor and wow. I told my partner, unfortunately, when you are in a narcissistic abusive relationship, a lot of what you say gets pushed to the side. And so I'm telling him, him and he's like, well, I have to go out of town. I'm sure you're fine. You're not even due for two months from now. Just call the doctor and go see about it. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I go, I go to my doctor. He didn't check my cervix. He didn't do anything. He said, you're not due for two months from now. You're not having a baby. I'm like, okay, well, what should I do? He's like, get some rest, go sleep. And I also in that situation felt oddly gaslit as again, and so instead, I went and enjoyed my day. I went to Target, walked around Target, started looking at home things and baby stuff just to like stir up some motivation to like get the house together. Um, went to the park, went for another walk, had lunch somewhere, get home. I started taking a driver's recertification class to get a discount on my insurance. <laughs> And I said, something is not right. I'm not crazy. I know I'm not crazy. And so I called my neighbor and I said, hey, I know this is probably like weird. I know I'm not due, but something is definitely off. Can you take me to the, to the hospital? I just feel really weird. It's like my cycle, but times 10. And she took me mm -hmm. to the hospital on the way to the drive. I started feeling like this pain increase. And then this factory motion that I was feeling started to get closer and closer together to where it was like five minutes apart. Mm. And I said, I think I'm going to have my baby. She's like, you're not due, Janae. It's probably like something. She's like, but if you say you're, due, if you saying this is happening, let's just go and see. Cause you cannot be over there by yourself. You know, my uh, son's dad, he had already left out of town that morning. Mm. So I get into the hospital and my water didn't break or anything, but I could just feel I hate to be so descriptive, but I could just feel my pelvic floor inflating and just mm -hmm. feel it just expanding. And I remember them putting me in a wheelchair and they were going to take my vitals because I told them when I was due. And I'm just sitting in this room waiting and they rushed me to a secondary room and I had my baby within 20 minutes and wow. he was premature. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, Janae. And I was there pushing that child out by myself with this foreign nurse. These people don't even know. I don't know who they are. Never met them because I had a birth team already pre-planned with my doctor. Mm -hmm. And all of that went out of the because it was an emergency. And um, I called his dad and I said, hey, I'm having the, you know, when I was giving birth, um, going through the contractions or whatever, I said, I'm going to have the baby. I'm going to have the baby just really quick. I remember hanging up and then like hours later he showed up and he had Mm -hmm. been out of town like two hours away. Um, But he showed up and I had already given birth and I'm just exhausted breastfeeding this new baby. And that was it for me. I was like, no, this is not right. It's not normal. My mom, my dad, my family couldn't even, even the family that did want to come there to support me. There was so much toxicity in the household that I knew they weren't welcome. So I felt so wrong about it. And I knew that wasn't the will of God for my life. And that was a spiritual shift for me of wanting to figure out how to get out. And I remember just going into the holistic health more, uh, going into meditation and just Mm -hmm. trying to do everything and just searching, 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 Mm -hmm. feeling lost and just wanting to find a solution. Never once thinking, go back to the Lord. So... You had done that for a while, kind of different things. Tell us briefly about some of the things you did that you just weren't getting any peace on. Um, so the manifestation, I was listening a lot to Bob Proctor's The Secret. I had heard about heard it. I watched The Secret in the eighth grade in school. It was we had to do a an essay on it. So mm-hmm. it's even like infiltrating the schools now. New Age is so prevalent. And that was when I was in eighth grade. So I can only imagine the difference now. But I started to do do manifestation, vision boards, visualization, Mm -hmm. meditating on the things that I wanted and desired in my life. Um, It led me to like a very carnal perspective of living. Like I was only doing it for the things that I could attain or the lifestyle I could have. And not even because I was a materialistic person, but I just wanted out of the relationship. So I was envisioning what my life would look like outside of this person. And I was practicing that and just reading books by Eckhart Tolle. Um, I got into The Alchemist and The Four Agreements and um, Oprah's Super Soul Sundays and just all the people that you would have on there, like Gary Zukav and, um, you know, just uh, Abraham Hicks and how she talked about manifestation and how she would have this out of body experience and these spirits would inhabit her. And, And at the time, it's so crazy. I remember discerning that something was wrong about that. But thinking, oh, well, she's saying all the right things, not realizing that this woman is constantly being possessed by demons. I'm Mm -hmm. sorry to laugh. I'm not laughing because it's funny because I'm nervous, like just talking about it, that I really was comfortable with Mm -hmm. participating in these practices. And then every teacher had a practice. Every teacher had a method. Every teacher had a manifestation tool. And you're just boggling up all these things into a basket, trying to shake it up and see which one works like a, a game right. of dice. So yeah, you were, it's almost like these doctrines of demons were coming through telling you, yes, like you said, it, it made you feel like God, because as you're doing all these practices, God's the furthest from your mind because you're going to handle it. Right. Yeah. Is that right? I, I could, I thought I could, I thought that if I couldn't depend on my partner, couldn't depend on God at this point because I felt like God had just left me, you know, how could you take my mom? You know, why am I in this situation? Everything looks good on the outside, but really this is such a painful experience. I thought that I could fix myself out of the situation. And even then I remember still having moments where God was really present. Now I know that the Holy Spirit was leading me back to him because I would have encounters with people that would try to preach the gospel to me in public places. I'm like walking in this park in Savannah, downtown Savannah. And I remember this man coming up to me, asking me that I know Jesus Christ. And I remember just being in in a classroom for something that I was trying to learn about holistic health. And there was a woman there that was Christian. And she's like, I wanna learn how to eat well but I don't believe in the doctrines behind some of the things that are taught. 
but I'm still going to show up because I might touch somebody here. It was just little, little crumbs. And I say crumbs on purpose because it was small enough to where I could eat from it and think about the Lord, but not big enough for me to feel full. And Mm -hmm. interesting because when I would have those encounters, I would feel so disturbed. Mm. (laughs) I was off. Mm. Something was off with me. Um, So I ended up realizing that I wanted to leave the relationship. And I remember actually praying and not necessarily praying to God. I was praying to the universe. I used to use that word very fluidly and saying, universe, um, help me get out of this situation. This is not normal. I don't feel like I deserve this. Um, If there's anything that I've done wrong, just show me what I'm doing wrong and just help me get out. And uh, while my son's dad was out of town, I ended up getting a job and he didn't really want me to work at that time. But within that small period of time, and it feels so deceitful now that I'm talking about it, because you should never have to do this in a relationship. You should never have to go behind your partner's back um, and, and try to make a way to get out of something. Unfortunately, when you're in something that's abusive, it has to be that way because you can't communicate those things or you'll constantly go through that cycle of abuse. Um, So behind his back, I ended up getting a job. Um, I had applied for some jobs and the Holy Spirit led me to this one job in Savannah and it was a roofing company and they needed an administrative assistant. And I remember that somebody in that company was a Christian as well. And I got hired on the spot. The guy was like, oh my God, you're very smart. I really like your personality. I think you'll be a good fit for our team. And he was like a 24 year old millionaire who had started this company from the ground up. And it was so crazy because I remember his personality reminded me so much of my partner. And I was like, wow, I really got to get out of this. But I, there was a Christian woman in the business and she would speak to me and just like speak positive things to me, you know, have her Bible verses and, you know, just talk to me. She would see me with all my green juices and stuff. And she's like, why are you Mm -hmm. drinking? And we'd just have conversation, but something about her motivated me to like want to exit even faster and quicker and just get it done. And Mm -hmm. so I just trusted that the universe was going to guide me to the next place. And I remember calling my sister and saying, Hey, I don't know if this is too much of me to ask, but is there a possibility that I could come live with you? She had a boyfriend, the same boyfriend that was with her, she was with previously. And she ended up asking me um, to just wait and see if he would say it was okay. He said it was fine. I came within like a few weeks after saving up some money. And Mm -hmm. I strategically know that God was so good because I actually that year filed for taxes because I hadn't worked in so long. And somehow the way the taxes work, because I had been living out of state, I didn't owe anything in taxes. I was able to get a tax return for the previous jobs that I had worked and never filed for. Wow. And it's so crazy because I would see these numbers all the time, numbers nine, four, five. And I ended up getting a tax return for that amount in thousands. Wow, Janae. And I couldn't figure out where, how. And it's so crazy because when I filed, they didn't release the money to me. But the week I was about to move, which was actually like five months after filing, it Mm. released my bank account. And I did it. But the spirit put this fire under me. And I remember packing up the car and like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm leaving. And I'm Mm. so scared and I'm shaking with every item that I have to like, (sighs) so nervous, putting it in the car. And then I remember driving away, coming back to Georgia and sleeping on my sister's couch and Mm. finding all these like odd end jobs and getting into a holistic health clinic where I started to see how holistic health and new ageism were like paired together. And that these people that I was surrounded by, they looked really good on the outside, but weren't. And I was having new narcissistic relationships, except with coworker with a coworker, except I got sexually assaulted at my job. Um, not sexually in a way where they, a person had sex with me, but, um, I was learning about how to take x-rays at a um, holistic health care clinic. And I was there to work in nutrition and there to work in just like 
physical therapy. And the person that was teaching me how to do these x-rays, um, he took that opportunity in the x-ray room when everyone was away to touch and feel on me inappropriately. And so I was just in shambles. I had just left this toxic relationship. Um, I had went through this weird health journey and had lost so much weight, didn't know how to feel confident in my new body, but also felt better because people started to notice me because I'm now not in a narcissistic abusive relationship and covering myself and shaming myself. And so now I see people see me, but they're not seeing me for the right reasons. And so that was turmoil. It was just hopping from job to job to job and trying to find stability. And I'll tell you this part, and then I'll get to the more, this is closer to the end of the story that I could share with you guys. Um, three months into living with my sister, I felt this urgency to just move and find my own place. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do that with the income that I make, but somehow God is going to do it. And so I remember doing a manifestation ritual. I'm not proud of this. And I know that God, God's grace is so good because even when you make poor decisions, when you're stuck in the world and you don't have the discernment to know something is wrong, God's grace can still operate through that situation and he'll set you up to where he blesses you prematurely, even when you don't deserve it. Mm. To him, it's not premature. It's just his glory and his grace. But to you, you know, you don't deserve it. And how it happened was I remember thinking, oh, it's I need to find an apartment. So I'm researching one day thinking that I probably won't be able to move for a month or so. And I see this apartment come up and I said, I'm going to go view it. Me and my sister go and view it. And there's this older woman, a woman of God, <laughs> of course. Yes. And this woman of God is talking about how good the Lord is in her life and how blessed she is. And we're telling her about our mom and, and, and how she passed from cancer. And she's telling us about her experience. I believe she said she had cancer in the past and that God healed her from cancer. Um, mm -hmm. grace of God, she was healed, right? She didn't go into specifics or what she did, but she spoke about just God's goodness and she's helping me tour this apartment. And me and my sister are like, yeah, it looks good. And, you know, we should, we should definitely get more information. And she said, Hey, I'm just going to tell you this right now. I will let you get this apartment. If you can show me that you have two months of income that you make this amount of money and as long as you're going to be clean and it's just going to be you and your son, I'll let you have this place and you can have the first month's free, first month's rent free, and you don't have to pay the deposit. Wow. And then she went back on her word and she's like, well, my, the landlord's gonna, I mean, the property owner is going to have to have at least a deposit, but we'll reduce it for you. And it was originally should have been like $1,600. And she told me to just give them $800. And I remember getting paid and I was like, when can I meet you and give you this $800? She's like, well, I'll give you the keys. And, you know, the same day, if you could just give me the deposit, she ran my credit. I had never had an apartment in my name. Um, my credit was good. I had the income to, to match according to what she needed to prove. And mm -hmm. she gave me the keys like within a week. Wow. And I didn't have to pay that first month's rent. And even some of my utilities, somehow God would just bless people to bless me. Um, someone bought our bed. Someone bought our pots and pans. When we moved in the first night, we didn't have heat. And it was November. It was the first week of November. The, mm -hmm. the heat hadn't gotten turned on yet. And me and my son slept on my yoga mat. We mm -hmm. slept on the yoga mat the first few days until they came and turned the heat on and someone blessed us with a mattress that next week. Wow. Talk about God's love and provision for you. I love yeah. that. Jeanette. And your son. So tell us now, when did you kind of tell you had a dream? So share with us about this dream or an experience where you felt God come to you. The Lord Jesus. So I had moved into the apartment, got into another toxic relationship with someone that was abusive. 
Um, and this time it was not just narcissistic abuse mentally and emotionally, it became physical. And it was very subtle physical things, but there was one time where it got really bad and there was even damage done to property in the home. And it was so weird to me because I never been somebody that would accept that. I always was like, I saw my mom go through that. I will never go through that. And just mm -hmm. somehow it found me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember saying to myself, this isn't normal and wanting something different. Because even through that, I'm still doing the manifesting, still messing with crystals, listening to tarot card readings mm -hmm. and wanting and desiring something else. So a friend of mine out of the blue that I know from high school called me. Oh, she messaged me on Instagram and she said, hey, can you come to my house? And I said, sure, I'll come to your house. I don't know why she wanted me to come to her house. I put in the G in, in, put it in the GPS, find out she was five minutes from me. Go to her home. She's pregnant. She's revealing to me that she's pregnant and having this new baby. And she wants me to be a part of her new chapter. And I hadn't seen her since high school. Mm. Okay, I don't know why I'm here, but this is exciting. I'll be here for her. Maybe she doesn't have people and maybe I just need to be here for her. We sat down, talked for four hours and she started talking about God in that conversation in this church that she started going to. And she invited me. And after I left, it was just a thought in my mind. And maybe about six months later, <laughs> six months, I said, I'm going to go to church just woke up and the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to go to the church. I went to the church, had a profound experience, literally cried, gut wrench cried during the service, came home and was like, I'm not living right. Something is off and I need to live better. And I said, God, universe, whoever you are, whatever you are, I need you to show me who you are. And I need mm. you to be clear. Mm. Who, who is God? Mm. And I was writing it in a journal and just sitting in the middle of my living room and I have like skylights and it was a lot of sun and just feeling like this overwhelmingness of heat in the house and just feeling like that was a little freaky and weird. I don't think I'm going to say anything else to the Lord because <laughs> this was odd. Uh, I was just a little, you know, because all my practices before that were all intentional things I did, not stuff that happened to me. So it was a little weird to get a response. Mm. And so within about a month, it was the nighttime and I'm in, I'm sleeping. I know you said it was a dream, but it was actually real life. So that wasn't a dream. I woke up from a dream okay. and I'm out coming out of the dream crying in the dream. I was crying and I'm coming out of the dream crying, weeping tears. And mind you, I had been in another toxic relationship. So I'm sleeping next to someone and I'm like, oh, what do I do? I don't want to wake him up. He has to be at work at like 5 a.m. in the morning. So I get out of the bed and I'm crying these heavy tears into the hallway bathroom. Something told me to go to the hallway instead of my bathroom in the master bedroom. Go into the hallway bathroom, trying to be as quiet as possible while my son is asleep in the next room. And I try to turn the light on, but I couldn't even express how bright that light was that night. It was so bright that it blinded me. I was, wow. I fell to my knees. Mm. I fell to my knees and I'm just weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? I'm literally freaking out. Maybe I'm having a panic attack. It doesn't feel like a panic attack because I've had them before. Maybe I'm sick. What's going on with me? Did I have a bad dream? I don't know, but I'm just weeping out. And I remember falling to my knees and just feeling this urgency to lift my arms up. And I said, I accept you as my Lord. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And immediately the lights dimmed to normal. My eyesight became normal again. And I just got up off my knees and I looked around like, what? What? And it was so crazy because when I blurted that out, I blurted it out via an, an, an impulse. It wasn't me. Mm. It wasn't wow. me. It was your was, spirit, huh? It was my spirit. Yeah. And see, blurting it out almost like as if you were about to um, 
throw up. I, I hate to say that word, but it's it was like almost like a word vomit. Oh, wow. And I, and I looked, I stood up and of course the mirror is right in front of you when you're in the bathroom. So I looked in the mirror <laughs> and I started cracking up laughing. I was like, what is going on? And, I, and I'm having this, it's so crazy. And I this big laugh and these tears start flowing from my eyes mm -hmm. and I'm like weeping still. And I'm like, I go back into the crying and it's like so overwhelming. And I have these literally, I cannot describe what it felt like except for butterflies all over my stomach, in my back, literally tingling up my spine. Um, I remember I had a patient when I worked in um, chiropractic care. Um, she described sciatica. And I said, that's how I felt in my whole body when I, when I had that experience. I felt like I was having sciatic nerve damage just shooting up my body. Wow, um, that's powerful. So you had a physical feeling with it. It was physical. And the light experience was so bright. And I remember asking, like literally verbally blurting out and saying like, what was that? And I had an audible experience again. Like when I was a little girl, when I asked God to help me find the glasses and it said, this is what the love of Jesus Christ feels like. I heard a little masculine voice tell me, this is what the love of Jesus Christ feel like. And then I just got back to normal. And I'm like, OK, I wiped my face and I remember getting tissue and like cleaning my nose and going to lay back down in the bed and saying to myself, I can never sleep with this person again. I have to be celibate. And I woke up the next morning. I told him my experience and he was just like. You need psychiatric assistance. <laughs> you, you always have these weird experiences and um, I'm beginning to worry about you. But and Janae, you had a true transformation. Like it was yeah. clear to you, something changed. Yeah. Mm. I journaled it and I asked God, I said, if Jesus is my Lord and Savior now, what do you want me to do next? And within a month, I was, I had ceased all physical sexual activities with my partner went completely celibate. I stopped sleeping in my own bedroom and started sleeping on the couch. And I told him that, you know, he had to go. I said, I unfortunately cannot continue to live with you. It would be mm. against the will of God. And that's not the will of God. Let me ask you a question now. Since this transformation, do you feel a supernatural strength come over you at this point? Absolutely. That was different. Yeah. Yeah, I never would have been able to stand up for myself back then. I would have never been able to say, I, I'm not sleeping with you. I would have never been able to say, hey, you got to go. I remember even like being super kind and saying, hey, I think we should separate and just being so fragile <laughs> because I was afraid of how he would react. Mind you, I experienced physical abuse and I was actually afraid to tell him that he had to leave um, because I was thinking maybe that he would start to abuse me. And um, I remember telling him that and I, I got this, I got blessed with this new job that was like double my income. And the Holy Spirit just started providing for me and preparing for this person to leave. And we got into a huge argument the day that he left um, because I told him like, there's no coming back from this. I cannot be with you. Like, mm -hmm. like God really actually revealed to me. I had a dream about seeing him possessed Oh, in a, wow. engaging in a sexual act in my dream. And um, mm -hmm. when I was looking at him in the dream, he turned back and he looked at me straight in my eyes and the face of the enemy came through his face and he grinned wow. at me so wide, almost like that cat in the in um, Alice in Wonderland. The grin went really wide. And um, when I woke up, I asked the Holy Spirit what he meant. And he said, that was the demon that's possessing him. He has to go. Wow. And so all of this led to me getting that new job. You know, I'm like fasting. I'm starting to pray. I did the Daniel fast. Um, and, and I literally just was like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I started going to church and just being influxed in the community around other believers and just researching about Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, I know who you are because I used to follow you, but this is different. This is, it came with a, it's like I put clear eyes in, like your, your contacts are foggy and then mm. you put in eye drops and then you just see everything. Right. So those, those blinders were 
off proverbial blinders. Yeah, the Holy Spirit woke me up and um, he ended up leaving and we got into that huge argument. He physically hurt me that day. And after that, I never saw him again. Um, and after that, I dealt with a lot of spiritual warfare because after I let go of that relationship, I didn't realize that I would have to go through deliverance from being intimate with him and being intimate with my son's dad and having done things that were out of the will of God and didn't even realize that I had a soul tied to this person. And I did practice self-deliverance at home because I'm like, if I've been through all this new age stuff, I know I can get through this. And so I remember starting to sleep with my Bible. I would hear things in the nighttime. I would have spiritual attacks in my sleep. Um, I didn't know what incubus and succubus was, but I was having sexual attacks in my sleep where I would wake up literally having a sexual experience, like a, a female releases. And it wasn't, com it was like, almost like the word R-A-P-E. It wasn't enjoyable or pleasurable. It was like it was being taken from me. And I didn't know what to do. And I asked God and I prayed about it and I started learning about deliverance. And I remember watching a deliverance um, service online and literally God is so good. I'm in the in my bedroom and this will kind of close everything up because I know we've been on here for so long. But um, my son's in the bed playing on his iPad, has dinosaurs laid out all over my bed. Um, and I am listening to this deliverance ministry and this woman starts praying and just speaking that these spirits come out of you. And I remember standing up and feeling this urgency to pray and start speaking in tongues. And I'm speaking in tongues and talking to the Lord and I'm just speaking over my wound. The Holy Spirit moved my hands to my wound. And it was like the Holy Spirit was telling me that's where the demons are. Put my hands over my wound and I started speaking in tongues over my wound. And I remember like feeling like I needed to lay down and laying down on the floor and feeling the Holy Spirit almost lift me from my shirt like this. And I started having that response of like feeling like I'm about to throw up. And I just started saying, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. And I'm saying it so fast that I'm speaking in tongues, but I know that I'm identifying that it's the name of Jesus. But I've never called Jesus Yeshua <laughs> in my life. Even growing up, I grew up Baptist. We don't say Yeshua. And I'm like, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. And I'm like throwing up almost, phys not physically throwing up, but like the feeling it's like me throwing up and I'm feeling the Holy Spirit lift me from the ground, like this thing pulling at my shirt, like I had on a shirt and I'm feeling it grab me by the collar and lift me up off the ground and let me go, lift me up and let me go, lift me up and let me go. My son is on the bed and I'm crying on the floor, yelling Yeshua. Wow. Comes and says, mommy, are you okay? And I started bursting out in tears. I didn't know what was happening, but um, it was deliverance and I'd never experienced that in my life. And I didn't know that it was deliverance until I realized I wasn't having any attacks. I didn't have any more attacks after that. There was nothing happening in my home. I didn't hear any more noises, wow. no more dreams, no more spiritual attacks in my sleep. I was actually barricading my door because I was so fearful my front door, putting wood planks in front of my door, mm. praying over every room of the house because I was so afraid. And then I learned that God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. And I had that deliverance um, that day. And I thought I was super off. I'm like, Lord, I know it was you, but that wasn't normal. And I don't, I don't want to go through that again. And he's like, you never will. As long as you abide in me, you will never have to go through that type of deliverance again. But I had to get those things out of you. And I realized afterwards that God was using Yeshua, the name of Jesus, to cast the demons out through my own voice. It was almost as if you're seeing like people on TV out there, like, you know, <laughs> the exorcisms where they're saying the name of Jesus against the spirit. But God had because I couldn't, I didn't have any resources. 
uh, God used my own voice to cast out demons in my own body. That's how much he loves you, how much he loves us. You don't have to have a certain formula. He'll do it any way he wants to do it. Yeah, he will. Wow, what a story. Wow. I don't care if you live in a remote island. Right. Nowhere, Jesus can reach you. Amen. Amen. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It's been such a treat having you with me today. And and Janae, I just want to ask you, you know, grace has been a huge theme for you. You've said that to me before, as well as in your testimony. Can you just tell us exactly what grace means to you? I know the the actual definition, um, but for me, it's the epitome of what Jesus Christ represents. Um, I named my son Zane, and I didn't even know until years later after naming him that his means his name means God is gracious. And oh, wow, that is so how, cool. I realized that it was the theme for my life. It's mm-hmm. the theme of Jesus Christ and his love for me. If people want to reach you, Janae, tell us where they can find you and about your ministry. Yeah. So if anybody wants to reach me, all you have to do is type in Guavas Grace. I know it's a weird name, but it's just God gave me a new name when he He washed me and cleaned me. So um, it's G-U-A-V-A-S. Guavas, like the fruit, and then grace, like Jesus Christ. Um, So Guavas Grace on YouTube. I actually am permanently deleting my Instagram and any other social media platform as of next week because the Holy Spirit has told me to just only do YouTube and to make it testimony based. um, So I won't be able to be reached in any other way. Wow. Will you just pray us out, Janae? And that we can, that the Lord wants to extend that grace to people watching today. Yeah, thank you, Julie. I appreciate it. Um, Father God, I just want to say thank you so much for all the grace that you have granted us, Lord. You are such a faithful and consistent and just a persistent God, because for years you, 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 you search down for that one Lord God. You will leave the 99 behind just to search down for the one Lord. And I thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy for not leaving any child left behind, Lord God. We thank you that you are continuously working in our lives and that you are operating as just so much more than the Lord over our life, but also our father to those who have been abandoned, Father, those who feel like orphans in the spirit, who have been children who have been lost and didn't know that they had a home in you, Christ. We thank you that you have reassigned us a new name, reassigned us a new address, and reassigned us a place in the heavens, Lord God, in the kingdom with purpose and value, and to know that we were loved before we were in our mother's womb. We thank you, Lord God, that we can glorify you, that we can give you the praise, that we have the urgency to tell our testimonies, no matter how dark or how diminishing it may be to the physical character that we hold. But we know that it, it, it simplifies the spirit that it literally lifts and glorifies your name. And we, Lord God, submit to you in everything that we do. And we thank you for using mm-hmm. our vessels to share the testimonies that you give mm-hmm. us through our life experience to give you glory and to, to lift your name up on high so other people may know it. Lord, we ask you for forgiveness and repentance, Father God, for anything that we may have engaged in, anything mm-hmm. that we participated in knowingly and unknowingly that may have led us astray from your path and your will for our life. And we thank you, Lord God, for your restoration, that you Mm -hmm. literally can take something broken and make it new, that you can take something used and restore it to its factory settings, that you can literally take us, Lord God, from our lowest to having us rested in the high arms of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your spiritual, um, your spiritual divine hand being on us, Lord God, and for you to touch our lives in ways that no human being, no other spirit, no other being can ever operate in our lives that way, Father God. And we just mm-hmm. ask for guidance, mm-hmm. for mercy. We ask you for peace and patience, Lord God, in the process. Just because we get saved does not mean it's over. Just because we give our lives to you doesn't mean that we won't experience the warfare. We ask you, Lord God, for that patience and that peace in the process and that you give us 
that's capacity to receive all that you have, whether that just be wisdom, understanding, knowledge, revelation, not the things of the world, but Lord God, the things that you have as gifts for us. I thank you, Lord God, for Julie and her husband, um, her partner, and just like the love of God that is operating through them, the, the worship that they have in the things that they do, Lord God, and the intentionality that they have to just spread the word of God through these interviews. And I thank you that you are resting your hands on them, that you will multiply them, Lord God, in every area of their life, and that you will use them, Lord God, as a vessel to spread the word of God. I thank mm -hmm. you for your children, Lord. I thank you for your daughter and your son. And I just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.